Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you'll be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. If you've been inspired by the guests that we've had on the podcast, please like, subscribe, comment, hit notification bells, whatever you can do on the platforms that you're listening on, so that more people have the opportunity of hearing these and engaging in our community. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne. Our guest today is Chaim Mayospin. Chaim has been on a couple of times before. If you haven't heard those, I recommend you go listen to them. I'll put the links in the description box below. But for people that haven't heard those, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Uh, yes, I am a Jewish Galilean. It means I live in the Galilee, the north of Israel. Uh, originally born in the United States. I came here about 25 years ago as an immigrant, a new immigrant. Uh, there are many who actually make their immigrant, Im- they become immigrants to Israel. It's called Aliyah in, in Hebrew. And, uh, and so what I do on the day to day is I have a charity that helps these immigrants get, get settled and all kinds of needy people, both Arabic, Hebrew speakers, all kinds of needy people who live in the Galilee. Um, and, and that's called the Aliyah Return Center Humanitarian Aid. Give them some food, some clothing, shelter, kind of exactly what the good Lord would want all of his followers to be doing. Um, cause he was a Galilean, don't forget, walking on the water of the Galilee. Um, but yes, uh, also I have an advocacy, like just to speak truth about Israel. It's a discipleship school called the Ambassador Academy. Uh, there's a prayer house, Vertical Galilee House of Prayer there where groups come in and pray. It, it really is, is teaching people the facts about Israel that are often misconstrued or just not, people just don't know the, the facts of past, present, future and uh, uh and so on so it it is it's what i'm busy doing a uh, day in day out also i am a soldier i have this rifle here i am a a uh, sergeant major in the combat engineer corps i've been 20 years ago is when i was first drafted of course i didn't have to serve straight the whole time for the last 20 years after three years mandatory service you're then on what's called reserves placed on reserves which is readiness in reserve for when a war will happen, but you got to keep up your training and do do your um, army duty every year for about a month, a year. Some countries, I think like, I don't know if England has this. I think Switzerland has this. Uh, I'm not sure certain countries in Europe have this. Uh, I think France, I don't know if they have this where you have to serve about a month, a year. Of course, now it's been more than one month. This year, since October 7th, I was called up on October uh, seventh, eighth is when I got in in 2023. So it's been about 10 months. I don't know when this will come out, but, uh, whenever this comes out, it, I, I've been in a long time, all going on a year, uh, protecting my family, just like it says in the book, uh, the good book that we've got to be good shepherds with the staff to feed, but also the rod to protect, uh, the sheep of the house of Israel. And Nehemiah chapter four, verse 14 is a real it's a real powerhouse for me where it says, go defend your families, go defend your children. Don't let them fall prey to the enemy. And I believe we're a continuation of that even today. And then for people that listen to this, they want to go and find out more about you and your organizations. Where can they go and find out more? Uh, well, they yeah, go to Ali, our return center to find out how one can help with humanitarian aid. Uh, again, it's food for the like vouchers, these gift cards here. This will give a family and a, a supermarket cart full of food hey what if they need to learn hebrew well we have a hebrew school they need to get that to to be successful in this land what if they they need some clothing well we have a clothing distribution emporium it's all free all donations been going for 12 well 12 years or more and uh oh do they want to get some furniture They're, they can't stay in our free housing forever we got to move them out teach a man to fish in the galilee it's not actually fishing in the galilee it's teaching them how to be not a charity case and that's why we give them the scholarship for higher learning. That's why we train them for the in the for the factory work, so they guaranteed a job. And so to find out more about that, that's aliyahreturncenter.com. Alia A L I Y A H Return Center spelled C E N T E R dot com. Then, but to join the Ambassador Academy Discipleship School to come and and volunteer, all that uh, to go to the prayer house to to be part of the faithful Galileans lifestyle. Well, they, they would have to then uh, go to Faithful Galileans, G-A-L-I-L-E-A-N-S, Galileans.com. And yeah, there are two different charities 
two different banks, two different um, boards and everything, but very much, uh, it's like you have two hands and they work together. Um, I will put those links in the description box. So uh, they're ready for people to go and check out. Um, Chaim, we've had the privilege of being able to get to know you for the last few years. And uh, you are someone who's well-respected inside and outside the church uh, globally. And uh, I think it was just uh, yesterday or the day before we were messaging. And I said, hey, could, could you come on and, and let's have a chat? And I, I think it'd be really good for people to hear from your perspective, what's been going on, but also about what you've been doing and how some of that happens. Um, could you just talk a bit about what your specific team does? Okay. So because of the two different charities, maybe I'll start with the Faithful Galileans. And uh, well, I, say, well, I mean, I mean about now since post October 7th. Okay. The what military, you've been doing, military uh, yeah. perspective on things. Yeah. So exactly as a, as a Sergeant major, uh, in one of the most dangerous, you know, military arenas in the world, very, very close quarter combat, uh, urb urban warfare, we're, we're fighting guerrilla warfare, warfare uh, people. And so when you when you have a guerrilla warfare um, battle, so or a war, what it is, is if the guerrilla war warfare, like, like, let's think Vietnam, if the guerrilla warfare, if the guerrilla warriors don't get eliminated they win and if the conventional army conventional army doesn't um totally win they lose if they don't completely win full victory it's like we lost if they don't completely lose and there's still like one guy it's like they won they're like hey i won i'm still here one guy that's a very strange thing about guerrilla warfare and uh guerrilla warfare has been a tactic in iraq it's been a tactic in Vietnam. It's been a tactic in uh, Afghanistan. It's also a tactic in Gaza, which means you don't really see the enemy so much, but you'll definitely feel the rocket propel grenade or the uh, cornet, Klimagor mine, TATP, TNT, um, all kinds of stuff. And you try to find these um, command and control centers like tunnels, logistical centers, um, places where they will go and, and attack and, and take people hostage you know 251 people were taken hostage not that long ago a few months ago and um it's our job to bring them back because we're a tribe we're tr many tribes the tribes of israel the people of israel we have to uh fulfill our commitment one to another it's our moral and biblical uh duty to do that and not to leave them strand not to leave these you know how many was there killed um you know 1,500 or something killed. I don't remember exactly how many killed, but what it is is that my job is to go and scour throughout different areas like Beit Lahia, Jabalia, Rafah, Rafiach, it says in biblical Hebrew, Rafiach. Um, and you go back to these, uh, many people don't even realize that, that the ancient Israeli synagogues are there in Gaza. Ancient Hebrews found in Gaza. Um, people don't, People don't get, they kind of have this, um, I'm like, guys, it's not Michael Jackson. It's not black or white. There is a lot more, um, <laughs> there's a lot more, um, it's a lot more complicated than that. When you look back at thousands and thousands of years of history, well, 4,000 years ago, Abraham came here and who were his kids? How did that even start? Who was Ishmael? It's, it gets complicated when you get into, oh, Hagar is Keturah the same as Hagar, two different. And it wasn't that, that wasn't the Jewish people from there. That's the Arabic peoples, okay, according to the Quran, is, is there any land in the world promised to the Jewish people? Oh yeah, the Quran says the B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel, are promised the lands of Israel, according to the Quran. But is any, is any other country promised to, you know, is Palestine promised to somewhere? No, it's not. Jerusalem's not mentioned at all. But I think, see what I mean? If people don't know these things, and they feel things, and they operate by emotion. So when we go in the midst of this, I am also privy, and I see, uh, privy to and see, quite a lot of indoctrination, paraphernalia, which is straight up lies. Straight up lies. It's almost like Mein Kampf or the Elders of Zion Protocols, which are, which are fake, proven to be fake. Jewish people didn't write this. It's a faked um, thing saying all the problems of the world are the Jewish people. That's what they say in Gaza. Instead of saying, Ooh, we have a beautiful three-story, four-story house overlooking the beach. 
fancy, pristine beach. Oh, we're getting jobs from Israel by the thousands a day. Um, electricity, water. We're so glad to live our life here. And, and uh, hey, let's think, can we make a, a train system here? You say train to take Jews to Holocaust? No, no, no. No Holocaust trains. I was talking regular trains. No, no, not interested. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's just an indoctrination. And so I'd say big part of what I'm doing there is scanning, searching for these tunnels, mapping the tunnels, uh, bringing a lot of logistics to be able to, down to even bringing in food for people. You got to be able to bring in food, supplies, sensors, uh, all kinds of stuff through very dangerous areas where people do die. Mortars hit my friend. He died. Another friend was, you know, it's very dangerous, but we are making the whole thing happen as someone who's a little older, who understands more how things work, whereas more of the younger soldiers wouldn't have an idea of what, how to do all this. After 20 years of being the first one ever to do first, some of the first ever to do the tunnel uh, warfare. We even studied America and the um, the tunnel rats of Vietnam just to even, we realized that things needed to progress from that point to the point we are today where we are the top of the world at doing this. And it's very hard. So um, maybe we can just rewind um, yeah. slightly. So we've heard a bit about what you're doing now and I want to come back to some of that and the, the tunnels. Were you doing work with tunnels before October 7th? Because you know, the, these tunnels really came to um, people's attention during Operation Protective Edge, which was a number of years ago now. So have you been done doing tunnel work from, from back then? Uh, and then if you could talk a bit about that, and then also where were you on October 7th? And, and how did things start unfolding for you um, on that day? Yes. Um, and even just before we go into that too deep, I'd love to just say, you know, when you love Israel, when you read the Bible for what it actually says and the actual promises of God over this land, it doesn't mean you hate Arab people because there's promises over the Arabic people too. It doesn't mean that you have to hate them. I have so many friends that I love dearly that are Arabic people, some even from Gaza, who ran away because it's a dictatorship and people are getting killed uh, just for playing music in a wedding. Their own people are getting terrorized by their own leaders and robbed like the opposite of the opposite of Robin Hood. It's it's robbed from the it's the rich are getting richer uh, on the people, poor people's back. Anyway, point is, is yes, we started noticing uh, terror tunnels a long time ago. I think it came to a head, let's say, in 2014 with uh, Operation Cast Lead. And you have uh, Gilad Shalit was taken into a tunnel. So we knew we knew that tunnels were being constructed, but we said, OK, well. You'd think, again, you'd think 2005, Ariel Sharon says, guys, I want peace. I want pe I just want to dwell in peace so badly. Let's leave Gaza. Let's give them a, essentially a sixth Palestinian state because they had five options of Palestinian state before that offered. Would you like a Palestinian state here? Would you like it here? Would you like it there? Would you like it anywhere? They're like, no, I would not like one here. I would not like one there. I would not like one anywhere. Quote Dr. Zeus. That's what they were guys are going dr zeus on me these palestinians so number six gaza ariel sharon says why don't you take the whole of gaza we'll remove even the graves of jewish people we'll remove our our dog that died we're going to take every bit of jewish people out 2005 and that's when i went in the army so almost 20 years ago and that was my first scenes of the army before i learned anything about tunnels i go in there and i and i see now, of course, there's even some caverns and things from ancient time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about terror tunnels used specifically to murder innocent people, used specifically to put your weapons in there to shoot and, uh, and attack. And, and so that's what I'm talking about, terror tunnels. So, um, so what it is, and you know, Gaz has mentioned in the Bible many times, negatively, uh, children of Israel had to leave, not make Aliyah from Egypt. Like I go there to Philadelphia Corridor, I look at Egypt. There's Egypt. We gave them Sinai back after they attacked us and, and it, you know, 1967, six day war, we ended up giving it back to them. But my point is I look at Egypt. Why didn't we make our immigration as from Egypt straight into straight through Gaza? Well, it was, a, it was a problem, problematic place. Even then in, I'm talking thousands of years ago, we went around the desert and went around and went around by Saudi Arabia and, and went in. 
so to answer your th- your question is um when i'm there in this in this very very hard and inv- h- harsh environment and um I don't know if I want to go to the point is we said, this is your Palestinian state number six. Enjoy it. You'd think they would have enjoyed it. But immediately after, instead of all the infrastructure being used, the, the greenhouses, the sewage systems, the uh, everything, and not forget, forget about just that. What was it? $8 billion? $8 billion being given. Each of the leaders becomes a uh, multi, multi, multi billionaire. Ismail uh, all, all the leaders. And, uh, and so they just decided to start shooting missiles and constructing tunnels from 2005. That's the thanks we got from, quote unquote, freeing Gaza, which we did. But that wasn't even God's will. We're supposed to be dwelling together in the land, in the promised land. And that is actually part of the promised land. So we shouldn't have done that. But we did. And we proved to the world what happens when we, quote unquote, free Gaza. Proved to everybody. We didn't have to prove to the world, but we proved to them. And I think God judged us even through that. Judged Ariel Sharon, who was the idea it was to do that. He went into a coma right after that. He eventually dies. And uh, people think it was like a judgment for, for doing that. What the Norwegians, Oslo, Norway, were wanting us to do in the Oslo Accords in 92, was it? So tunnels were being, beginning to be dug. But in 2014, it came to a head where we got a soldier dragged in, one soldier dragged into a tunnel by some, what I believe is, is an occultic blood death cult, occultic blood de- death cult, which, which is even beyond what one would think about just saying radical Islam. It's like, it's a little beyond that even when you see what they, what they do. And it's, so we said, we got to get, we got to get him out of here. We got to start dealing with these tunnels. So let's go in and try to find some of these tunnels. And it was very dangerous, very hard, but we went to certain areas, we went to Jabalia. I went into various areas, found some tunnels, and we blew up some in a very primitive fashion. We weren't so skilled at our trade back then. <laughs> I was le- we were still learning all the right ways to do it. I'm trying out new things every day. I was like a guinea pig of tunnel warfare, uh, just trying to figure out how to do what's the best and least chances of dying uh, in, in these uh, unforgiving landscapes. So eventually they said, look, we're going to we're going to release 1000 murderers with blood on their hands who kill infants, children, because that's what they want to do, which is it. And I really I, I know it makes me very sad when I see people trying to make a parallel of Israel and Hamas. There's some people I don't know if you would could imagine this. Your brain could possibly imagine that there are people that would try to do something so evil. People that their whole charter is to genocide and kill every single Jewish person in the world that in the world. And then kill America too, say you know, and then say, oh, when Israel's trying everything they can to not hurt civilians, trying so hard, oh, let's call off this strike, let's call off, but but sadly, in wars, people die, and even there's casualties, which is sad, heartbreaking. But they're like, see, you're the same. Like, what? <laughs> that's not our charter. That's not our goal. That's yeah. not our thing. But to just finalize this, from the thousand terrorists that we released, we did get Gilad Shalit, Shalit back, and I had a vision about this prophetic vision uh about a year before it because we were like where is he is he in this tunnel where is he where is he was in my mind and i had a vision of of someone walking in a a, a hamas walking in and saying gilad you have a choice now uh your your people want you to be released do you want to go to freedom you want to stay here and die with us what do you very strange question and he's like of course i want to be free all right get out of here they unshackled him and he uh Went out to the light of a tunnel. He walked out in the rays of light. And I saw it in a vision. Then it happened like a year after that, where that exact thing happened. He was released. And we gave 1,000 convicted murderers a free pass to go back to Gaza. And one of those you might know is named Yichie Sinwa, who then went around instead of saying, well, thanks, guys. Thanks for everything and for the brain, for saving my brain, for being a brain tumor. I almost died there. But thank you, Israelis, for doing the operation for me and saving my life there. By the way, thanks. I know it wasn't fun to be in jail, but I know I was a murderer and I killed so many of you guys. So I, I, I'm, I'm now rehabilitated and I'm, uh, no, he decides to then mastermind October 7th massacre. And did we make the right decision again? It's up for debate. But uh, that's those are some of the things that have happened. Well, so 
uh, going back to October the 7th, um, I can remember very clearly where I was and what was happening on October 7th. I can also remember very clearly what I wanted to do on October the 7th, which was just get on a plane and come back and be with you all. But that was neither sense nor sensibility, so we waited till we did. Where were you and what were you doing and what was your reaction? Yes, um, there is a thought that was in my mind, sadly. Well, you know, I'll answer this way. My commander, I'm not going to say his name, but my commander in Yahalom, which is, again, the elite combat engineer unit for special missions, such as high-stakes hostage rescue, tunnel finding and destruction, uh, ho uh, hostage, yeah, hostage situations like someone's got a bomb on them, on a plane, on a boat, on a bus, underwater, uh, uh, all kinds of various uh, landmines, um, all kinds of uh, engineering, unique engineering combat scenarios. So my commander, and you have to be very well trained to be to get accepted to this unit. It's elite unit. It's like uh, like the Rangers or like um, the Marines or whatever. It's not a regular uh, unit, and not that many people are in it. And and so my commander was camping on October seventh. It's just to give you a little perspective of it. Camping near Gaza. He was camping with his, his daughters right near the Gaza border. And so he didn't have a gun with him. He didn't have anything with him. He was just camping. And, and uh, we don't actually, we normally leave this in the army base. This uh, shepherd stick, usually leave it in the army base. And uh, leave it in the army base. And then um, and then we bring it out. We, we only get it once we are actually in the, in the actual war. So um, he was camping. And suddenly he hears all these rockets falling and he's like, well, it, it happens that they want to just try to destroy us and uh, we'll just run for cover. So they go and they hide for a while. But he's saying this is an insane amount of rockets. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. What is going on? Ah, it's probably nothing. Your brain tells you it's probably nothing. Then he sees all these um, uh, people in black masks and uh, white Toyotas uh, or Helix, Heluxes drive by. And, and he sees them driving by, uh, or driving somewhere on a, on a road and all smoke and shooting. And he's like, oh, maybe some of the Bedouin community had some Bedouin on Bedouin violence. And maybe the police will sort this out. Man, it seems like some Bedouin clan. We have, we have a lot of Arabs who live here, about 2 million Arabs who live in, in Israel, uh, Israel, Israeli citizens. There's also about 2 million who live in Judea and Samaria. Some call that mistakenly the West Bank. But Judea and Samaria, the heartland of the promised land, about another 2 million. Then you have, uh, I'm, I'm rounding the figures, about another 2 million in Gaza. So you got, and, and total here, you only have about 7 million Jewish people, you know, around. So you have pretty much the, together the same amount right here of Arabs. So he sees these and he's like, it's maybe one of the clans of some Arabic family. Maybe they had an honor killing or something. Uh, it's very weird. I'm just going to keep driving safe maybe i'll park over here he eventually goes home turns on the tv and sees oh my goodness there's people getting massacred i barely made it out with my life and that was hamas that i saw it wasn't bedouins it, <laughs> that was the actual hamas inside israel same thing with me to answer your question uh i was at we we meet on shabbat and gather and worship and pray read the bible on shabbat in, in our congregation so i was there and it was Shabbat, and it was it was a high holy day because it was uh, the end of Tabernacles, the last day of Hoshana Rabbah. And uh, so we build these actual tabernacles. So you're actually in your your tabernacle with the you the pomegranates and the grapes and the decorations, and you're remembering that we came out of Egypt and made Aliyah two thousand years, you know, uh, almost three thousand years ago, and we're celebrating that that God will tabernacle with us and bring peace to the earth. And Emmanuel, God with us, tabernacling with us. So we were doing all that. And then I, then I hear uh, reports like uh, something's going on, something's going on. I'm like, same thing. It's got to be nothing. I mean, it's just some something. I see there's a lot of rockets, but uh, you never think it's the, the military down south, whatever it is, is probably handling it. Then I get the call later, later on. It's like uh, you are activated for full on uh, eight draft. Eight draft, Sab Shimone, is um, war. A draft. I'm like, what? We're not at war. There's no war. What? What in the world are we? Is it? Is it Lebanon? And all of us thought, 
I don't know what they're doing in the South, but Lebanon's the big threat. We all knew that. We're all waiting for Lebanon, Hezbollah, because they were growing, growing, growing in their power. Like, they're about to have one of those days where the commander, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, gets dumped because he's a bad boyfriend or whatever, and then decides to <laughs> enact a war on Israel. Whatever, some reason that they'll have, and they'll decide, or financial issues, and say, now let's blame the Jews. Let's do a war on them now. Unprovoked. And that's what we thought was happening. So I said, I guess I'm going north. They're like, no, you got to go south. Go go get your gun. Go to your base. And, and then I off I Zoom. They, they wash my feet. We realize it's serious. Uh, I get my feet washed by uh, our team at the Vertical Galley House of Prayer. My father-in-law was there. And I said, I commission you. I commission you um, to rally the prayer warriors. This is war. Rally them all. Give, them no re- give him no rest, neither day nor, nor night. So he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And uh, people got to finish that verse when they prayer. People got to finish the verse off. They can't just say, give him no rest, neither day nor night. Stop. There's no period there. They can't invent a period and push it, put it in there until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You know, it's prayer. It's a prayer house for Jerusalem for his plans to return. here. So that's kind of how it evolved. And eventually I go south. Eventually we start. I get my gun. Eventually we start clearing out the kibbutzes from yeah, there's people on fire, there's houses on fire, there's the smell of death everywhere, there's bodies up all over the ground. There start, I'm like, what am I seeing? Oh my goodness, how can I even sleep tonight? There's missiles everywhere. I'm like, how bad is this? Is this a coordinated? Is it also Lebanon? Is it also Iran, Iraq? Are the terrorists that are hiding in Jordan, is it Syria, Saudi? Are they, was it a trick? Are they not going to be peace with us? Are they going to, I'll tell you, I was quite, uh, it was quite a mental, um, and it still has been, actually, this whole time, very mentally hard time. And just as I'll give you one story of my, of my good friend, he says, you know, I, every time I close my eyes, I see this woman who's on fire. She's burning the trees on fire, the grass on fire, she's on fire, all by the Hamas. They burned a lot of things as well. And I can't get that picture out of my head, he says. And uh, another friend says, if you want to know what hell could be like, if you go into kibbutz and you see bodies all over the floor fire coming out of the windows and and you go in and you see you smell the death and the burning bodies you're like this pretty much feels like what hell would be like i don't want to go there so i'd say for all of us it's been a um a tough time eventually we get the the word we're going to go get the hostages back we've cleared up the area there's no more active hamas that we know of roaming they've been all dealt with to the best of our knowledge unless there's some sleeper cells in some somewhere as far as we know, we've cleared them all out and we are ready to go find these hostages. And after Biden left and uh, Rishi Sunak left, so this all took kind of a long time, but we eventually did go in and began the slow and tedious and careful, unlike America in Nagasaki, unlike America in Hiroshima, unlike many other wars, America in, you know, unlike many other America in Vietnam, unlike, unlike the West the rest of the West, we were very, very, very slow and very careful um, and made safe zones and moved people to safe zones and delivered pamphlets and, and drones with Arabic language and so on. And that's how we slowly, slowly progressed. And we still, 10 months later, have not completed the work to wrap up my little monologue. There's still half of Rafah untouched, uh, tons in Jabalia untouched. Tons in Gaza City, untouched areas that for sure will have more infrastructure, more weapons manufacturing, missile manufacturing, Hamas, um, command and control centers, hideouts, and so on. Still many, many, many places, which would take literally, no joke, years to, at this speed, a speed of progression, it would take years to um, slowly try to dismantle that stuff. Wow. I mean, you said very quickly, you know, and get the hostages, it it passed over quite quickly. What are your thoughts on those hostages that you have not got? Yeah, um, well, it definitely seems like they're going to want to keep the, I mean, there are some that have been killed for sure. We've seen that there's, we've seen the bodies, we've brought the bodies back um, after digging them up. Some of them were put in cement. I mean. Some of them, were, I mean, it's just amazing what the, what what people would do to keep that card. So the ones that are alive, 
I don't know how many are alive, and no one will give us an answer, not the Red Cross, not the Hamas, not the Islamic Jihad, not the Izaldin al Qassam, and nobody will, not the UN. Uh, so we don't really know how many are alive still, but what I do know is that they're going to keep those alive and probably make sure that they stay alive. We know some of them did undergo, undergo torture and rape, but as far as being alive, yes, we, we believe that they are alive, some, and they'll either be freed by military force, which is what the current uh, majority believe, that it's probably only going to be military force and the rest is just not really working. Um, but uh, some think political, uh, political agreement might work. Here's just a quick issue of three different perspectives, really quick, is that um, the, there's the military perspective, there's a the political perspective, there's the kingdom of God perspective. And uh, the, let's say the political one is just give them more, more Starbucks. You know, you hear, you hear them saying, um, we will kill every Jewish person until they're all gone. We will uh, make a caliphate and uh, we will dominate every country. The flag of, of um, our flag will fly over, over their countries around the world and all the Christians will be removed as well if they won't convert. So that's so. So they're saying that, but then the, the political response is, and you've probably seen some of this, is sounds like they're saying they want more job opportunities. It sounds like they're saying they want more Starbucks, maybe more more coffee flavors in their Starbucks, and then the, everyone's going to be happy. Maybe more money, economic uh, incentives, but that's not what they're saying. Though one has to really listen. What are they actual? Let's translate. We can get translators and hear exactly word for word. We will never surrender until. The West is toppled. Okay, so that's what they're saying. Then why don't we just listen and believe what they're saying and not what we think, what we want to project onto them. They didn't say if you give us another $8 billion or so, like you gave us in the last couple, few years, a couple decades, you know, $8 billion. Well, then give us another $8 billion, Everything's going to be fine. So that's the political solution is let's just try that again. The military solution is Anywhere where I see terror, we will take it out. And if more terror comes, we'll take that out too. They don't like it, we'll take them out too. You know, this is the military approach. And it just it's just keep going until the minds are changed and uh, and we can rebuild. Uh, the kingdom perspective is well, I'm not saying anything against I'm not saying I'm, I'm against the first two. But I'm just saying that um, kingdom perspective is really there's going to come a day in the future, where hearts and minds will be changed supernaturally, supernaturally by God, proving that he's the true God of Israel, and other false deities are not legit, legitimate. And, and that day is going to come where there's going to be a highway and people worshiping and praising and uh, in inside Gaza, it says they'll speak the language of Canaan, which proto sinaitic language was actually Hebrew, an early version of Hebrew. and um, I mean, I believe in the Garden of Eden. That's what was spoken as Hebrew. Um, that's a big claim. And, uh, and so that's the kingdom perspective. It's going to be Arab and Jew together in the land, not one or the other, but together in the land with hearts to teach our children, maybe math, language arts, you know, all kinds of arts, Bible, not just uh, a, a strange version, I mean, like I said, a strange version of the of the Quran. No, we want to ha teach them truth and God's truth. So that is the kingdom perspective, and and they will learn war no more. They'll learn war no more. They will eventually um, uh, learn peace and and crops and all that. So that's what I believe. Wow. Um, can you talk a bit about what is involved with when you find a tunnel? And then how you then make it safe for the next team to come in and um, explore further. Like what, what does that process look like? Yeah. So there's things that are secret that are, but there's things that already are on YouTube that you can see. Uh, one of the things you see on YouTube is the drones that can fly under underground, which are not using satellites and they fly underground and they can map and uh, they can, then um, map and, and detect turns and curves. Uh, we have ways of mapping, which I think that is secret, our ways of showing on the screen exactly where it's going and what's going on. 
uh, ways of finding that's for sure secret. Um, I would say that, but yeah, but being able to then uh, put your robot through there, that's known. Put the dog through there, that's known. It's on YouTube, so I can say the dog will go with a camera, with uh, other sensors. We'll be able to then smell the explosives, smell the, uh, the danger, sometimes give its life for Israel, little doggies. And uh, very sad, they get a military funeral too, if that happens. Uh, but then eventually going through the various challenges of which there are many, not just explosives and not just blockages and not just um, traps, booby traps of all kinds, not just that, other things plenty of other things and um you probably saw the tunnel that was just discovered in the in the near egypt going to egypt the philadelphia corridor tunnel and so our guys we're the we're the guys we're the, we're the only guys who deal with this i mean others might try to copy us but we're the only professionals in this field and uh we passed by the area so many times didn't take the time to use the minimal intel that we had to scour and scan with our tools um that area so we actually realized at that point we said oh man we need to really take the time to put the diligent due diligence on certain areas where it seems like there's something that you just have to do the work under fire and and find and and then of course eventually dismantle destroy blow up flood with water operation atlantis flood with water uh which didn't really provide a long-term solution sad to say and uh yeah but a lot of the other things are reason being why they're secret is, is because once the enemy who's who's uh always looking for ways to thwart ways to thwart will then take uh informations and counter them countermeasures that's the way war works is just measure and then countermeasure and then countermeasure and then countermeasure and uh and one doesn't want to give uh them the ability to know exactly how to thwart our um our measures Obviously, when people think about booby traps and stuff like that, you think about you, you know your typical sort of trip wires and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but maybe could you just share maybe a couple of stories of things you saw that were there to trick you, to trap you, that it even shocked you? Like maybe it's like wow, just the depravity of whoever it was that set these up it is unbelievable. Because um, maybe people don't know. Um, some of the tactics that were used to try and to try and catch you out. Yeah. Well, just a couple without getting too gory details. Uh, I often try to skip over some of the gory details, but just some things that are really known is uh, one that they would make, they bring with them a way, uh, a crowbar that opens the gas tank and they'd stick in the gas tank. It kind of like a, a, a certain explosive and they turn it and then it, and it starts a, a, uh, it starts a, um, a, a um gives them time to get and then it opens a charge which blows up uh cars and stuff with with people in there who are then locked in jammed in and burned alive this way it's one of the things they would like to do uh which i've never really seen that incorporated in other armies or other um terrorist other terrorist act except for isis and isis did of course um burn people in cages um, that was one of their things. It seems to be a, uh, something of an extremist, uh, approach, but what they would do is they would put a, a, um, let's say it could be a doll. It could be a backpack. It could be a, um, a body of like, say a mother is, is dead and she's holding the hand of, of her daughter. So they'll booby trap the daughter. So when the dad comes back or anyone else says, Oh, let's see if the daughter's alive and moves her that activates the bomb. It's a, it could be a pressure activation. It could be, uh, of course, you always could have a cell phone activation, but that's not the case now because the person's already long gone. There's, um, there's a maintained pressure activated, uh, mercury switches, um, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. You have all kinds of stuff that would, uh, uh, ball bearings that fall, um, which cause a react, cause a, a, a uh, explosion. So, um, what it would be is they'd booby trap bodies. They would booby trap backpacks. So someone's like, there's my backpack. 
a little kid's back, a little kid's toy, and they move it. You don't speak, but they had all this planned. You know what I mean? They had everything ready. They, they didn't. It looks. Here's the mistake. People that look at the videos of them just running through the fence, you think, well, they just one day woke up and said, let's blow up this fence and just go and uh, have a heyday. Kind of looks like that. Um, for whatever reason, it was that. But there was a huge plan. When they dug the tunnels, there's attack tunnels. that cars can go out, blast the, blast the dirt out, and the dirt falls into these shafts great with great on top and the dirt falls into the shafts and flies out and they can drive instead of shoveling it takes too long and can immediately drive out with their pickups and their and their weapons and start to uh and hit the fence and then they have uh tunnels that looks like uh theoretically they slide it escape tunnels they're smaller if everyone's chasing them towards this big opening they like whoop and they go with the hostages down into these shafts uh which go really really deep some of them like 50 meters deep and then you have your your hideouts and your food and your cells, bars, bars that didn't just appear there. They didn't just. They woke up one morning and there's cages underground, cages for hostages. They planned the whole thing. The fact they didn't really use their tunnel tunnel part. They did have some attack tunnels into Israel, and some of those. But but I'm saying the big their big coordinated plan didn't really come off as it as it was planned to. But they did have, as I said, some of those fire things um, and some of those booby traps ready. So they're carrying with them. I'm going to go in. I'm going to see a little girl's body. And I'm going to put this booby trap on her body. It takes time to plan that. Years to think of their diabolical mind. Then, I'm, then when they move the girl's body, it'll blow up on them. Let's set this up. Let's get it ready. Let's stick it in. That had to be brought with them, carried with them. See, that's different than what people might think. They woke up one day and, oh, let's walk over there. No, you know, and, and so I really hope that people will see that when one is serving the devil, it's called wicked. Wick is, is the word, it's like a wick is, is, is an interwoven um, strand. Evil is maybe more just like, I do a bad thing and that's evil. Someone gets angry, hit, kills someone with a hammer. Okay, that's evil. But if someone's doing something wicked, it means for years and years you've been premeditating and planning and digging and and buying and bringing from uh, North Korea and from uh, Russia through Iran into through Egypt into the tunnel and making your whole rocket system and planning all this. So that is some of what I've seen. Uh, maybe as a, a final question as we end um people talk about how but the innocent palestinians and and you referred earlier to things aren't black and white it's it's actually it's a very simple statement but actually it's quite a complicated there are some but also hamas dressed like the innocent civilians uh you have footage of dead bodies being driven through gaza and and what looks like your average person spitting them and kicking them and so like this innocent is very difficult to figure out who is and who isn't you've also talked a bit about your love for you've got friends for on in gaza yeah. the, the palestinians so it, when you see this you see how muddied that or how blurry that line is of innocent and guilty how do you keep your heart tender to the to the people that live in gaza the, the palestinians and not just become tainted by everything you see that you're exposed to the horror of it and not sort of end up wanting to keep them all at arm's reach how do you navigate that in your in your heart well i'll do a two-part answer first part is there was just a a man i forgot his name right now but he does a social media interviews within the west bank judea and samaria is the true name of it and he'll say do you believe that you can dwell in peace ever ever with jewish people or and no, they'll say never. They must all die from the river, Jordan River, to the Mediterranean Sea. They all must be gone, and that all must become a waqf, uh, which is a, a uh, holy Islamic land once again, as it was under Suleiman the Magnificent and so on. So, um, but then before that, it was the holy city of Jerusalem and the holy land. So, um, here's what it is, is that uh, they, they say there's no way for there ever to be peace. Eventually, one the day will come in Surah chapter nine that uh, 
even the rocks will say, there's a, there's a Jew here, kill him. The tree will say, hey, there's a Jew under here. Like this tree behind me is going to say, Kaim is under the tree. Come kill him. We're all waiting for this day. Allah. So that is what they're saying. Whereas you go to Israel and you're like, you, would you like to have peace? And like, absolutely, please. We're praying for peace every day. We don't want to fight. You go and interview. You, you can literally go and you see what the difference of opinion is. And it's very clear what people are taught and indoctrinated with. Now, that was my one answer is you see there what's in their mind. So that is a harsh reality that that's what they're looking towards is. And I'll even make it more. I'll bring it even home. Even a Christian who it, it has an eschatology like Israel doesn't matter. Israel doesn't, who cares? Then they might not pray for Israel. I'm saying whatever your eschatology or your end time scenarios, it can affect you today. A Christian who might be, might be thinking, well, God doesn't love Israel. God doesn't love the Jewish people. So why should I? I don't care. And anyway, they're all just going to die. And I'm going to go off to some cloud and a halo and hang out with Beyonce or whatever. I don't know what they're all thinking over there. There's a song called Halo. <laughs> so that's some kind of Christians. But that, if that's their, their end time, it affects them today too. But if we really see the truth that Jerusalem is God's capital, he will come and dwell there. You know, th he's the son of David, will to rule on the throne of David. David doesn't have a throne up in, in heaven. He only has a throne in the actual earth. That's something nobody's really talking about. The throne of David is on earth. Where on earth? In Jerusalem, the throne of David. And that's where Yeshua is. But there isn't a throne of David in heaven. There's a white throne. It, that's just, it's an interesting little tidbit people don't think about. So that's one point. Number one is your eschatology shapes your present day thoughts and actions. For them, it shapes a lot of actions. Number two, analogy number two. If you are sitting on a train and someone comes along with a knife and starts cutting someone's head off, very graphic, I apologize. You do nothing. You do say nothing. You just sit there and you're not paralyzed with fear even. You're like just hanging out ordering something does that mean that you are you i'm just asking it back jewish people always ask the question back uh, instead of giving a direct answer i'm going to ask the question back to you you if you're just watching this and this did happen in canada uh it's um, this is a real true story in canada that it happened some years ago there was a, a bus a greyhound bus or whatever buses they have they're driving and someone came and was cutting someone's head off very graphic it's true though and everybody in the bus said nothing did nothing now, they didn't commit the crime, but are they accomplice? Are they, are they guilty by uh, no, no action? In Israel, they would have just got jumped on by everybody. Grandmas would have been like, ah, leave them alone. What are you doing? You know, uh, it's, it's a hard question, but what does it mean to be innocent? Uh, or maybe the question we should be asking is, what does it mean to be righteous? One, righteous of, the things, one of the things that we say is, is silence always sides with the abuser. So yeah. by not doing anything, you are siding with the person who is committing that act. Now, whether or not you're doing it yourself, by not saying, by not standing up, you are allowing this person to do something. Inaction is action. Silence is, is something. You're doing something. Uh, imagine, imagine if people stood up against Hitler, there would have been no Hitler. But people were either silent or they were actually part of part of the Nazis. So my my answer is I just throw back on you. What does it mean to be righteous? If someone and, and there are some at the risk of their own life who will say, I cannot be part of this, you do it. I won't do it. I can't do it. I maybe I'm not gonna fight you because that would be death to me right now, but I just I cannot do this, guys. I'm out. Uh and uh and many then have to escape for their life because eventually people say, Hey, these guys aren't playing ball. Um, with the Hamas, and it, I'm, it's a very hard, it's a very hard choice. You think about um, Corey Ten Boom. In uh, we all like to talk about Corey Ten Boom. She's a Dutch, Dutch lady in Netherlands, in Holland, and uh, and she would would directly go against the Nazi orders, which was to round up all the Jews, and uh, and she did the opposite. She hid them in a hiding place, and I was in that hiding place myself, and I thought it's right downtown. Uh, Harlem, downtown Harlem, the, the the original Harlem, not the one in New York, and that's Harlem. And uh, and so she she hid them, and she's brave because she was she was an innocent. She wasn't a German, but you know what I mean? she's an innocent German because she is doing the right thing, 
even if it's secretly. And I, I have yet to hear those stories. You asked the question, how many are there? Where are they? I'm sure there are. I know that there's f- few different churches. Some of the churches, if not all, have been very steeped in replacement theology. The churches in Gaza, very steeped in replacement theology and anti-Israel rhetoric, even as a church, sadly. Um, but I do know that they have got, from what I've heard, they've gone to the safe areas, the humanitarian areas provided where missiles aren't striking, except for the one case where there, we said, we've got to get in here real quick because they were shooting missiles from within the humanitarian area. <laughs> so they were like, guys, we're going to go into this area. Um, so that, that's a kind of a longer answer, but I, I hope it gives food for thought in this mm. uh, answer. So I think... Oh, oh, sorry, one last thought. One last thing. I, as a believer, choose to look at everyone who's not shooting me as an innocent person. I just choose to do that. And as my perspective as a believer, I'm always to my joy and my honor to give out food, beef jerky. If anyone wants to send me beef jerky, I give it out to the soldiers. I'll give it out to Palestine. I'll give it out to whoever. I give them always water. I try to get cold water if I can. It's kind of hard to do, but cold water in bottles. Uh, and I'll give it to them even with some flavor to the Palestinian people. Now, is could one of them have been my enemy? Are they, maybe they still would want to kill me if they could. Maybe if they were giving me water, they'd put poison in it. I don't know because of their bad teaching, but I would just say this is that's what I do. If they're not shooting me today or blowing me up this minute, I'll say they're still, I look at it as they got a chance for a different future and I hope they take it. Maybe I'll be the guy to help them change their minds. Chaim, thank you so much. We appreciate you and, uh, everything you're doing, also your your heart in the middle of all this. And maybe through this podcast, you'll be the guy to change some people's minds who are listening to. Yeah, so I hope that for people listening to this, this is really helpful. You get get to hear some of Chaim's heart, help break down some of the intricacies of what it is that they're dealing with. Um, but hopefully, um, like Chaim's just talked about, his ultimately it's his eternal perspective that he has, which helps to keep his heart tender towards a people that um, are caught up in something so horrendous, some guilty, some not guilty. And then there's a whole load of gray area in between those two things. Um, so really, I guess for people listening, really think about what is your perspective that ultimately is deciding your mindset within this situation? And is that a good eternal or long-term perspective to have, um, which is shaping your mindset? Uh, And especially for Christians, what is your biblical perspective of eternity and how the future is going to unfold? And how is that molding your mindset now and with this specific situation? So Chaim, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And I hope we'll have you back again sometime. I know that things are looking really uh, up in the air right now in terms of is this conflict going to escalate dramatically in the next hours or days or, or not? Um, so uh, we'll be thinking about you and your family. Um, Maybe one fast la- last little word is, you know, like silence, the word appeasement, appeasement is another form of, of advancing the enemy if you're appeasing. So I, I would hate to see anyone else in a Western country experience what we've had to experience is called war on your actual shore, in your actual country, in your actual home, in your actual home. So I would hate for people to have to experience that before they understand what we're going through with our actual so the yeah. i pray for israel that we can not appease but bring a a strong um strong perspective and and to help people understand that there's a certain limit to what is allowed may god bless you and you Heim. thanks Heim. and everyone listening go check out his websites in the description box thank you Thank you for listening to this episode. Remember, if it inspired you, share it with others so we can see more people engaged in this community.